from the headquarters of Teleso English in Havana, Cuba. This is from the South and I'm Katrina Goss. We begin in Ecuador, where several student and teachers movements protested this Monday in rejection of budget cuts to the education sector promoted by the Lenin Moreno government. The measure to cut funds was approved last week by the Constitutional Court and condemned by both students and education workers' unions. The Federation of University Students of Ecuador denounced that more than $92 million are to be cut from the budget. Students warned that the measure puts approximately 300,000 young university students at risk and that some degree courses such as medicine and the arts will be removed this semester. They also stressed that they would remain mobilised and on the streets until an agreement is reached with the government that responds to the interests of both the student and teaching community. More than 20 wildfires have been reported in Noo Kempf Mercado National Park, northeast of Bolivia's Santa Cruz Department. According to the Ministry for the Environment and Water, the fires have so far consumed nearly 500,000 hectares of land across the park. Authorities also announced that an emergency meeting will be held on Wednesday to evaluate the situation. Sector Minister Maria Elva Pinkert also announced that Ministry forces are being deployed to locate and put out the fires. The de facto government declared a red alert and the Ministry of Defence explained that if necessary, water bombing operations would be carried out with a group of air tankers. The Secretary of the Environment and Sustainable Development informed of the difficult situation in various municipalities due to the weather conditions, including high temperatures and strong winds. Venezuelan Attorney General Tarek William Saab this Monday provided details about the arrest of a suspected U.S. military man for espionage and destabilizing acts inside Venezuela. We are going to provide details of the arrest, among others, of a U.S. citizen, allegedly a military man who was carrying out espionage and destabilization activities in Venezuelan territory with the support of stateless military and civilian personnel of this country. There is no other description of a person who associates with a foreign element to cause harm, to murder, to assassinate, because they are armed to the teeth, as we will show the weapons that were seized. Likewise, the Venezuelan Attorney General explained that the sabotage of the National Power Service and oil industry were among the objectives of the detained U.S. agent. On September 11th, just a few hours ago, the public ministry was informed of espionage and sabotage activity by U.S. intelligence agents and Venezuelan collaborators in the military field and state industry. That includes the National Electric Service as well as the oil industry. Just take a look where they were going to attack and cause damage. No other than against the oil industry and the National Electric Service. The Peruvian government on Monday sought a constitutional court injunction to block an impeachment vote against President Martin Vizcarra due later this week based on corruption allegations. Justice Ministry lawyer Luis Alberto told reporters in Lima that a lawsuit had been presented by the executive against the Congress on the grounds the legislature had exceeded its power in seeking to remove the president. Lawmakers voted to initiate impeachment proceedings on Friday on the grounds of permanent moral incapacity, which according to the government is a vague and questioned cause provided in the Constitution. The move came following accusations and audio recordings indicating that Vizcarra had incited his aides to lie to corruption investigators. And this Monday, Peruvian President Martin Vizcarra commented on leaked audio tapes linking him with the Richard Cisneros corruption case. In recent hours, interested sectors have circulated and handed over to the media a set of audios, and all these materials must be accordingly corroborated and investigated by the public ministry. I must tell Peruvians that what it is happening here is betrayal by someone in my closest circle. Likewise, President Vizcarra argued that the current controversy was a personal situation that's being used against him in the political context. This is a situation of a private nature that has moved into the political sphere and has been taking advantage of my dark characters. I have to deeply regret and apologize to the country because an individual at the presidential office in whom I trusted, not now but years ago, has generated this situation without basis and without any grounds and which feeds the gossip and the curiosity of many people. Hurricane Paulette made landfall as a strong Category 1 storm early this Monday on the British Overseas Territory of Bermuda, just hours after authorities closed schools, government agencies, air and seaports. 
Paulette was located directly over Bermuda around 6 a.m. local time, with maximum sustained winds of 90 miles per hour. Government officials had warned of heavy flooding, given that the storm coincided with an unusually high tide. Forecasters also warned that hurricane-force winds would impact the island for roughly seven hours. Meanwhile, National Security Minister René Ming urged people to stay indoors and also observe health protocols in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. Paulette has now developed into a Category 2 hurricane with maximum sustained winds of 105 miles per hour and is moving north-northeast at 13 miles per hour. At least five people were reportedly still missing at sea after the boat they were travelling on capsized on Saturday, nine miles south of Chubke in the Berry Islands, which form part of the Bahamas. According to the Royal Bahamas Defence Force, the missing people are Haitian and Jamaican nationals. Twelve people were rescued on Saturday and there have been no new developments since, despite an ongoing search and rescue mission to find other survivors. The rescued migrants were transported to the Coral Harbour base to be processed and checked over by medical personnel before being handed over to police and immigration officials for further processing and investigation. Antigua and Barbuda's Prime Minister Gaston Brown has announced that the Caribbean community is set to establish a travel bubble among its member states within the next 14 days in the midst of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Prime Minister Brown stressed that CARICOM representatives held discussions on the implementation of the travel bubble, which would allow citizens of CARICOM member states to travel within the region under special conditions. He also explained that a travel bubble would start with countries reporting a low level of COVID-19 prevalence at less than 20 cases per 1,000 population in the last two weeks. Meanwhile, countries such as Jamaica, Guyana and Trinidad and Tobago, which have reported high numbers of COVID-19 cases, would have to reduce their tallies in order to be included in the initiative. At least 35 people have been killed, including a child in Washington state, as a result of wildfires ravaging the west coast of the United States. Over 3.2 million acres of land have already been burnt. Authorities in California state noted that over 16,000 firefighters have been battling 28 major wildfires, which have left 24 people dead and more than 4,000 structures destroyed. Meanwhile, California Governor Gavin Newsom, Los Angeles City Mayor Eric Garcetti, together with Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden, have attributed the intensity of this season's fires to climate change, as contradicting statements by U.S. President Donald Trump, who claimed poor forest management by Western states was the main cause of the fires. Meanwhile, weather conditions are not expected to improve any time soon, as high winds of up to 40 miles per hour are forecast in the coming days in parts of California. President Trump visited Max Kellening Park, located in Northern California, on Monday for a meeting with local and federal fire and emergency officials tackling the blazes. A deputy mayor of the French capital, Paris, was signed Monday after allegations of sexual harassment levelled by a co-worker, just weeks after another deputy mayor stepped down amid protests over his links to a known paedophile. The City Council announced that Pierre Eidenberg, aged 78, had tendered his resignation just over two months after he was appointed Deputy Mayor responsible for the Seine River that flows through the French capital. The allegations against the official were immediately reported to the public prosecutor, the Council said in a statement. Eidenberg had served as Mayor of Paris's third administrative district for a quarter of a century. His resignation comes after another deputy mayor, Christophe Girard, resigned from his post in July after opposition politicians and women's groups demanded his suspension over ties to Gabriel Matzerf, a award-winning writer who has never hidden his preference for sex with adolescent girls and boys. This Monday, Austrian authorities confirmed a second surge in COVID-19 cases across the country. The total number of cases reported now stands at over 33,000. We are experiencing right now is the beginning of a second wave in Austria. We have rapidly rising infection numbers. 
Two weeks ago, we used to have 350 daily infections in Austria, and yesterday we already had over 850 infections. Around 50% of all new infections are in Vienna. We are especially affected here, but all over Austria the infection numbers are rising. Therefore, it is absolutely essential that the measures decided on by the government must be observed. In Japan, the ruling Liberal Democratic Party elected Yoshishidi Suga as its leader on Monday. 377 of the 535 members of the party voted in favour of Suga as the new leader, paving the way for him to replace Shinzo Abe as the country's next prime minister on Wednesday, as the party has a majority in parliament. The former ministers of defence and foreign affairs were the other two candidates for the position. Overcome this crisis and provide the Japanese people with a sense of relief and enable them to lead a normal life, we must succeed in what Prime Minister Abe has been implementing. The President of the European Council, Charles Mitchell, and Chinese President Xi Jinping held a meeting via video conference this Monday devoted to economic issues and the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, and German Chancellor Angela Merkel also took part in the meeting, which is a follow-up to the 22nd EU-China summit held on June 22nd. At the end of the meeting, Mitchell, together with von der Leyen and Merkel, issued a joint press release setting out the European Union's ambitions in its bilateral relations with China in a number of areas. The leaders welcomed the progress on the ongoing negotiations for the EU-China Comprehensive Agreement, especially on rules regulating state-owned enterprises, technology transfer and subsidies. The meeting also saw discussions on climate change and biodiversity, as well as international issues. President of Belarus Alexander Lukashenko arrived in the Russian city of Sochi on a working visit this Monday to meet with President Vladimir Putin. The leaders of the two countries were set to analyse the state and development perspectives of bilateral cooperation in different spheres, as well as issues of federal relations. Lukashenko and Putin were also due to discuss international issues and the current situation in the region, as well as topics related to a joint response to emerging challenges. The visit to Russia is Lukashenko's first trip abroad after the August 9th presidential elections. His results have not been recognised by extreme sectors of the Belarusian opposition, which for a month have been taken to the streets in protest. We are for the Belarusians themselves to deal with this situation themselves, calmly and in dialogue with each other, without hints and pressure from outside. We regard Belarus as our closest ally and of course, as I have already told you many times in my telephone conversations, we will fulfill all the obligations we have assumed. These events showed us that we need to stay closer with our older brother and cooperate on all issues, including the economy. The United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, presented the recommendations of the fact-finding mission on the human rights situation in Myanmar during the 45th session of the Human Rights Council this Monday. Three years have passed since the military operations in Rakhine created a terrible human rights crisis. The situation of many hundreds of thousands of Rohingya refugees and internally displaced people remains unresolved. In 2019, the fact-finding mission in Myanmar concluded that Myanmar incurred state responsibility under the prohibition against genocide and crimes against humanity, as well for other violations of international human rights law and international humanitarian law. This Council and the General Assembly also emphasized the call for accountability, but regrettably no concrete measures have been taken. National initiatives, including secretive and selective court marshals and the National Commission of Inquiry, have been inadequate and fallen short of international standards. Ivory Coast Constitutional Council has blocked a former president and a former prime minister from contesting the country's presidential election set for October 31st. Former Prime Minister and rebel leader Guillaume Soro was nominated by the Generations and People in Solidarity Party on Sunday, but the Electoral Commission has barred him as he was sentenced to 20 years in prison in April for concealment and embezzlement of public funds. Meanwhile, former President Laurent Gbagbo, who refused to recognise the victory of current President Alassane Ouattara in the 2010 election, was also sentenced to 20 years in prison in absentia last year for the looting of the local branch of the Central Bank of West African States. Meanwhile, the country's main opposition party, the Democratic Party of Côte d'Ivoire, African Democratic Rally, has nominated Henri Conan Bédier, who was ousted in the country's first coup since independence in 1999.
The candidacy file of Mr. Bagbo Laron doesn't comply with the provisions of Article 48, 50 and 51 of the Electoral Code and must therefore be declared inadmissible. The candidacy of Mr. Soro Kibafori Gijom is declared inadmissible. Authorities in the Indonesian capital Jakarta reimposed a partial coronavirus lockdown on Monday and vowed to strictly isolate anyone testing positive for COVID-19 as infections soared. The country is the hardest hit in Southeast Asia by the coronavirus pandemic, having confirmed over 220,000 infections and more than 8,800 deaths. The policy to impose partial lockdown is actually good, but I can't stop trading at the market. If I'm not working, I wouldn't have money. If I don't have money, what will I eat? Trading is my source of income, but I will implement the health protocol. People should learn from this. When the lockdown is reimposed, stop gathering. With this being reimposed, people should be deterred. Most of the infected people at the isolation center are not from this area, mostly from Raba Malaka, Jembatan Besi and Kilian Yar. We have to accept the center here. We are in crisis and we have to follow the policy. Tanzanian and Ugandan authorities have signed an agreement to develop an oil pipeline project in the East African region. Meanwhile, environmental conservation groups have claimed the construction of the pipeline threatens livelihoods and fragile ecosystems in the area. This project is another great victory for our nation. We have written another history of victory with Uganda. The first was that of the Kagera War, whereby we overthrew Idi Amin and he fled Uganda. That was our first victory. This one now is our second historical victory in economic terms, and this victory is for both sides, Tanzania and Uganda. 4.6 billion is officially the total amount of fuel that has been confirmed. This amount is found in areas in which 30% of the oil areas is found. The remaining 6.5 billion is in the Albertin zone, but it's only 40% of the area. We are still searching the remaining area to find more fuel. Protests continued in Algeria's capital Algiers on Monday to demand the release of independent journalist Khaled Rareni, who was sentenced to three years in prison for incitement to unarmed gathering following his coverage of anti-government protests that broke out across the country in February last year. We really hope that tomorrow it will be the very date of deliverance, and in any case we want to stop. It is not only Khaled who is detained today. I think of Mohamed Tatyajid, the poet of Iraq. I think of Balid Kechida, who has been in prison for months for a meme, who has not even been judged today. It is all these manipulations that we have come to denounce, and solidarity is an obligation. It is important to continue the mobilization. It is important to continue, including media pressure, both on the judicial authorities but also the political authorities, so that they understand that we will not give up whether journalists or citizens will not give up on the issue of the release of the detainees. Today we are trying to send a message to the authorities. We want to show that we support the journalist and colleague Khaled Radeni because he only did his job. The facts seated in his file are related to Khaled's work as a journalist in the field and it is not a crime. The head of the UN's nuclear watchdog said Monday that inspectors would visit the second of two sites in Iran within a few days, where undeclared nuclear activity is alleged to have taken place in the early 2000s. International Atomic Energy Agency Director General Rafael Grossi said his visit to a second site was imminent following a recent visit to the first. He noted the analysis of environmental samples collected at the first site would take two or three months. Iran's nuclear body announced it held constructive talks with Grossi during the first visit, which came amid mounting tensions over a U.S. bid to reimpose U.N. sanctions on Tehran. Yes. We had the first access, as you know. We saw each other when I returned from Tehran, and uh, the first access happened shortly thereafter. And then the, the, the second one will, will happen in a few days. So, uh, um, you know, we are, we, are, we are working. Yeah. With them, they are um, 
interested in developing nuclear energy for peaceful purposes, of course. Uh, so it is obvious that uh, when they get and they upgrade their activities, uh, including by the introduction of nuclear material in the kingdom, then we will have to have a stronger safeguard system. And nothing makes me think that this is not going to be the case. And we've come to the end of this news brief, but remember you can find these and many of our stories on our website at tellysoenglish.net. And you can also follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Tellysoenglish, I'm Katrina Goss and thank you for watching.